Hello, and welcome to the DC Bar Pro Bono Center's Nonprofit and Small Business Programs podcast series, where we talk to experts on legal topics of interest to nonprofits and small business owners. I'm Christine Kulumani, a staff attorney at the DC Bar Pro Bono Center. Today, we'll be discussing a very common topic for many small businesses just starting out or considering growth. So you want to hire employees. I'm thrilled to be joined today by David Broderdorf. David is a senior associate at the law firm Morgan Lewis. He is a member of the Labor and Employment Practice Group in DC. David works with clients across many varied sectors, including retail, energy, manufacturing, transportation, construction, and government. David is a longtime DC Bar Pro Bono Center volunteer providing his expertise at legal clinics and conducting small business oriented trainings. Welcome, David, and thanks again for joining me today. Thanks, Christine, it's great to be here. Now, this is my first podcast, so I'm hoping to not make it my last either. Um, and I confirmed this morning on the Apple rankings of podcasts that the Joe Rogan experience is currently rated number one. So let's try to give it a shot to at least get in the top 10, if not number one. I think we can do that. Today, we're chatting about something that's really commonly raised by small business owners in DC. Um, they want to expand their business, bring on additional bodies to facilitate growth, and are curious about what bringing on an employee means for the business. Yeah, and that's really a critical time uh, for um, the life of a business. And there's really two key goals for today's discussion, Christine, and that's deciding and discussing the uh, independent contractor versus employee issue and deciding what's right for for the business. Um, and then if the business decides that it wants to hire employees, there's some critical threshold considerations there that have legal implications as well as practical impl implications for the business going forward. Absolutely. So I think when addressing this, as you mentioned, the first order of business is talking about the distinction between employees and independent contractors. Right, and this is a really uh, critical issue. Um, there's a lot going on in the United States right now regarding the issue of independent contractors versus employees. Independent contractors are also called 1099 uh, individuals. And uh, really, when you look across the country, there's what I would regard as a crackdown right now on the use of contractors. Um, and I focus on trying to shift more individuals into the employment model for purposes of protections and tax um, tax issues. And so, for example, here in D.C., the attorney general has been engaged in various investigation uh, related uh, matters and other legal matters where, for example, there was a recent settlement for over two point five million dollars with a company. Uh, that involved in part, at least, misclassifying individuals as contractors rather than classifying them as employees. And I think also we've heard a lot recently about California, Uber and Lyft drivers, the gig economy, and whether these folks are really independent contractors or are they employees. Um, but it's not that simple, is it? Well, it's, uh, and that's a great example. As I, as I came to the DC bar this morning, I was in an Uber and it's, it's something where we just can't sort of get away from the, again, critical distinction between independent contractors and employees. And we're gonna get into why it really matters. Um, but in part, it matters because if someone's list, if someone's deemed a contractor, they basically get paid X dollars for their services and that's it. There's no payroll tax, there's no Medicare tax, there's no um, income tax component to that, at least with respect to the actual receipt of the compensation. And then all of the employment laws that we think about, uh, discrimination laws, leave laws, uh, many other laws, unemployment compensation. Minimum law, wage. Minimum wage. All of these things do not apply to contractors. So as you can see, there's a tremendous incentive to go with a contractor model but at the same time, the law is saying the vast majority of employee of individuals who are performing work for a business should be or are in fact employees as a matter of law. And there's various legal tests that go into deciding whether someone's a contractor or someone's an employee. That 
you know, there's a lot there. And I think that it's important for small business owners to really think through the decision about whether an independent contractor or an employee is the right fit for them. Oftentimes we'll hear, I don't want to deal with employment law. So I'll make a person who is effectively an employee in every other way, an independent contractor by title and by document only. But really, how is that determination made? How does a small business owner know if the person that they want to bring on without title, maybe without going in with a preconceived notion, what's the test? How do we determine independent contractor or employee? Yep. So for, for purposes of our discussion today, I, I wanted to highlight three key factors that are commonly used uh, across different locations in the United States and commonly used under various employment and tax laws. Um, I will caution all the listeners, though, that each location in the United States and each law may have slight variation in how they apply the factors or, or how the test looks, especially in some of the locations that are being very aggressive in this area. For example, California is trying to really make the test to be a contractor extremely difficult. But the, there's really three key factors that I want to focus on today, and that's the right to control, whether the um, individuals performing services outside the usual course of the business that they're working for. And then the other factor is whether that individual really is himself or herself or is part of an independent business or not when they're providing services. All right. So right to control work. That sounds like, you know, if someone's an employee, their employer controls the work. And if they're an independent contractor, that they're a little more in control. But what are some of the more specific control factors we look at? I mean, racking through my brain on both sides, there are so many different responsibilities and ways that different parties could have control. Yes. And I think what's easiest is to just break it down to sort of day-to-day -day job responsibilities and how does the business that's hiring the individual control or not the actual performance of work. So let's think about a couple examples. Work schedule. If 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 the business is saying you need to be here from nine to five, that's controlling the work schedule as opposed to over the next two weeks, I need you to get this done. You can get it done whenever you want to, nights, weekends, mornings. It could take you 40 hours, it could take you 10, but ultimately I'm not controlling your schedule. So there's a big difference between the setting of work hours, setting a schedule versus just providing a deadline for some deliverable or project. What about maybe there's a, one time type of a thing that somebody needs to be at? Would that automatically put them in one bucket or the other? It wouldn't automatically, but if it is a one time um, uh, project or event, that could lend itself to be more under the under the contractor model, both from a control perspective as well as one, one or both of the other factors that we're going to touch upon today. So, okay. but ultimately, if there's going to be a long term relationship versus a short term relationship, that could weigh in favor of, of an employment okay. empl employment uh, model. It's all about context. Context, yeah. And ultimately, uh, you know, unfortunately, uh, there's no automatic or black and white application of this test. So again, we're as we're focusing on the right to control, we, we look at the scheduling issue, but that's just one factor among many factors. All right, so what else? Let's look at schedule and hours. Right. Uh, so supervision and oversight. So again, is the business directly controlling and supervising and directing that individual in the performance of work? Or again, is it, I need this done. You're the expert. You know what you're doing. So go off and do it. And all you look at is the end result. You're not managing the day-to-day -day deliverables or tasks from a supervisory or oversight perspective. And what about quality control? So if an independent contractor or an individual that we think is one has been given a task, they go off and do it and they bring it back to the small business, is it okay for the small business to review it, to question it and to make sure, you know, in something that could be viewed as a bit like supervision, just making sure that it's really up to par and what the business expected? Yes, and it is, it is fine under the contractor model to demand quality and a certain level of performance, but the general generally the focus will be on the end result. So it won't be on a 
hour to hour by hour or day by day check in again, which looks more like supervisory control. It's more of a I hired you or I engaged you to do X job. Okay. And as part of that, I expect a certain quality or a certain outcome. And at the end of that process, I, as someone who contracted with you, am entitled to make sure it measures up to my expectations. So it's supervising the process of the work being completed, not supervising overall the work product. Correct. That, that sounds good and that makes sense to me. So we have those down, but what about you know some of the other factors? I mean, employee schedule, work hours, supervision, that's a little part of control, but there are some other factors too that I think of when someone is doing control. Um, you know, providing training or the skills and knowledge necessary to complete the task. That's right. So if, if, someone's, if someone's coming in generally into a contractor relationship, they're coming trained and skilled and an expert in doing something. They're not coming in as a novice looking to be trained, looking to be instructed and in how, to, how to go about day-to-day -day tasks. So again, this all goes back to that control factor, which is often one of the more important, if not the important factor in the test. And so individuals, again, who are coming as experts, easier to be under a contractor model versus individuals who need to be trained and instructed on how to do work. Okay, and what about, you know, thinking about training, if there's a certain way or a certain format the business needs the end products, is it okay to give instructions or training to an independent contractor on that, or may that take us towards the line of employee? Um, it, it could, but again, if it's back to where we were about sort of the end result, the deliverable, the quality level, if the instruction is just this is the expectation for the ultimate job or the deliverable, and then you go off as the expert and, and, and an individual who knows what he or she's doing and get it done, that to me could still be under contractor model. But if it's now I'm going to give you a roadmap of how to do your job over the next two or three weeks or six months, I'm going to give you a checklist. I'm going to give you tools. I'm going to get and make you uh, go through certification or training programs. That looks much more like an employee model. Okay. So we've talked about several things for right to control the work. Is there anything else that you think falls into this bucket? Um, those are really the key the key factors. Um, uh, but ultimately, that element of control can be defined pretty broadly. Mm -hmm. um, so there may be other factors depending on the context, but those are some of the most critical factors there that relate to whether or not the business is controlling the individual enough to shift into the employment model versus the contractor model. And this is something that it sounds like will have to be assessed with every person that's brought on. Look at each factor individual to them and then make a determination. Right, it's ultimately an individual by individual assessment. So it's really important to think about these things as early as possible. And if you're already uh, have engaged individuals as contractors to, contractors to think about how you're going about doing that right now and trying to see if you can steer that relationship in a direction that looks more like a contractor relationship or make a decision that based upon the factors, which we'll get in the other two factors uh, right um, shortly, that uh, you should be really looking more at an employment model going forward. Okay, and we can talk about more of what employment entails in a minute, but like you said, let's get back to some of these other factors that help us determine independent contractor or employee. So next is looking at whether the work is outside the usual course of business. What does that mean? Okay, so it's really important to think about the what I'm calling the hiring business and what is that business engaged in? So let's imagine a business that's engaged in making cupcakes. So their business is making and selling cupcakes. If that business engages, for example, an IT person to set up a website and the deliverable is a website that can sell product and or market product, those two entities, if you will, the cupcake business and the IT individual are really in different lines of business um, versus the cupcake business hiring somebody to bake cupcakes. Okay. The person they're hiring to bake cupcakes is really engaged in the same business ultimately of making and selling cupcakes, even if that's just one component of the overall cupcake business. Yeah, because you have the cupcakes, you have the icing, you have the whole process. 
but looking at really what's core to the business. Yes, that's and, exactly right. Okay. And I think that, you know, for again, for folks, this is going to be a very individualized looking at what their business does. Um, especially for folks who have multiple lines of business, yes. thinking about what is core, what is part of your day-to-day, -day, and what is ancillary to support what the business does on a kind of everyday basis. Right, and one more factor that's relevant to this, to this test in many locations is where that individual then performs the work. So back, back to the cupcake example, the person baking the cupcakes, if they're then coming in to that to that cupcake business's bakery and actually mm -hmm. baking then not only are they linked up to the business to the ultimate business model and business goal for that business then they're actually performing their work at the site of the business which then reinforces the connection to that to the to, to the line of business that the um, hiring entity is in versus for example the IT individual setting up a website he or she may be at their home or maybe at their own office or another location setting up and may never set foot in the actual bakery to do that job. Yeah, or if they do, it's occasional, right? Come in to hook up the internet or to take a picture for the website. Right, right. Uh -huh. So two factors down. Okay. Um, thinking about whether or not someone is performing an independent business. Yeah, so it's ultimately taking a look at the person or persons that are being engaged are they in business for, for themselves or not? Um, so for example, uh, do they have their own business name? Are they organized as an LLC or incorporated or otherwise have some distinction between, them, between their person and their business, uh, if there is a business? And that's often a threshold question of does this person actually have a business? Are they out there competing for other clients? Have they engaged with other clients? Um, all of those factors will support a contractor model versus somebody who, who is not organized as a business, doesn't have any other clients, is only engaged with the hiring business. That looks more like an employee model. Okay. And what about somebody taking on work as an independent contractor with a business? Um, and for some reason, the work they're doing is taking up all of their time and they aren't able to work for anyone else. Would that shift them over to the employee bucket? Or if it's temporary, would it be all right? Um, if it's temporary, it might be all right. Again, looking at all the factors uh, combined. Um, but ultimately, it's really critical that uh, the longer the relationship, that there still be this, this prospect or this possibility of that individual getting other clients at some point. Okay. And if someone has their own business and is working with other clients, they bring the tools they need with them. So we talked about training and experience but also actual supplies, right? So that's something to think about. Does somebody have, you know, what they need to do the job? Do they have the computer? Do they have the software? Um, right, right, yeah. Things like, uh, again, under this independent business factor, it, it's gonna look like an independent business if they have their own equipment, if they have their own supplies, if they're uh, reimbursing or paying for their own expenses to perform that job versus coming with nothing or, 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 or little and then relying on the hiring business to give them the computer, to give them the tools, to pay for their expenses. Um, that, that's a critical distinction uh, under this factor. And, and related to that in part is sort of how is the compensation structure? Mm -hmm. um, because if you're engaged with what truly is an independent contractor or business, it's quite often the case that you're going to have a flat rate or a fixed price for that. So it's a build me a website and I'll pay you $1,000 versus come bake cupcakes and I'll pay you $15 an hour. The bi-hourly model for compensation is much more likely to be uh, supportive of, of, an, of an employment relationship versus a pay by the project, pay uh, a, a fixed rate, if you will, to get something done. Okay, so another factor, look at how the structure of payment works out. Um, and as we mentioned before, independent contractors aren't legally entitled, if properly classified, to the minimum wage. Um, so, you know, looking at these factors can be really important. Um, if a job takes an independent contractor 50 hours to do, and they're only getting paid a few hundred bucks. Right, right, um, yes. You know, and it's kind of on their time. 
but that money should not be the only factor. No, it's not the only factor, uh, but that said, it's one of those really sort of from an optics uh, angle, it's really an important uh, setup for the relationship. And again, an hourly pay by the hour um, setup is going to go down the road pretty far from the start uh, towards an employment relationship. Yeah. So also talking on the train of thought of pay, if the position is temporary, you know, there's work that only needs to be performed, maybe there's grant funding for six months to do it. Um, because it's temporary and we've talked about, you know, length of time and how it's paid and this is saying we only have money to pay you for six months. Would that weigh either way for independent contractor or employee in itself? Um, it, 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 it may, but I want to caution everyone that it that it, pro it may not have a big impact. So if, if somebody's coming in, coming in and they're being controlled with their schedule, they're being controlled with their work hours, they're being given the equipment, they're supporting the same line of business, again, making cupcakes for the cupcake business, even if it's intended to be a six-month relationship, it's still an employment relationship. So... But that, that said, if there is a defined project, a defined length of time, um, it could weigh in favor of a contract relationship, but again, you have to look at all those other factors that we talked about. Okay, so temporarily, temporary does not necessarily mean independent contractor. Yes. Good to know. So independent business or not, is there anything else we think you know, falls into that bucket or should we move on about you know, how we document all of this and you know if and when you make a decision about employee or independent contractor documenting it and making sure that you know the decision is right and that all parties are on the same page right um so i think we've covered the three factors uh fairly well for this discussion but obviously if questions arise uh, there's resources at the um the pro bono center and we can look at specific situations more closely and analyze them further but um, to your point about written contracts, um, so having a written contract that says someone is an independent contractor is not going to automatically make someone a contractor. Uh, bottom line is we can't, we can't waive employment rights by virtue of just sort of one line or a couple sentences in a, in a document that just says, I agree, I'm an independent contractor. Um, but that said, it is important that if a business looks at these factors and and reaches a decision that they are legitimately engaging people as contractors to think about how that's documented yeah. and to think about actually having a, a contractual agreement with that individual or with that other business that hits upon some of these factors that hits upon right to control basically saying i don't control your schedule. I don't control your training and I don't control your day-to-day -day activities. I just want this end result. And also baking in some of the other factors that we've talked about, compensation, um, supplies and equipment, length of the relationship, so that ultimately you have something in writing that reinforces the, the nature of the relationship and triggers a lot of these key factors and facts that we've talked about this uh, today. All right. And it's important after you have that independent contractor agreement, if you go that way, have an attorney review it before you have someone sign it just to make sure that the person is actually classified, looking at everything that David just talked about to make sure is in there. Please have an attorney review it. But if someone decides that an employee is the right fit or that somebody working for them would be improperly classified as an independent contractor, they're gonna have to go through the process of actually hiring and bringing on and taking on the obligations of having an employee. Um, and I think the first part of that is hiring folks and going through the process of recruiting and onboarding. Right, and this is often what can be scary or um, incentivize the use or the overuse of contractor relationships just because again, you could, you could, you could put on a list a, a lot of obligations and costs associated with employees that you would then look at a contractor model and they wouldn't be there. And that's, again, part of the reason that a lot of states and locations are cracking down on the use of contractors. And, 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 if, and if it's legitimately determined that people should be hiring employees versus contractors, it's important then to take those steps to do it right and to make sure 
that from a foundational level, as the business grows and as it develops, that all those tools are in place to make sure that it's as painless and it's as easy as, as possible. So from a very high level, um, without going into too much detail, because there are other resources available to help with the nitty gritty details of hiring, but what does somebody need to do for their small business to bring on an employee properly? So I think there's really three key um, steps to take when it comes to uh, the hiring process for employees, and that includes uh, job postings or job announcements, um, also interviewing properly, and then offer letters. So for example, on job posting, it's, it's really critical that if you're gonna have any external postings um, that describe a job, that you give, you give some thought to what exactly are the requirements for this job. Um, and that's that's important for two reasons. One, it's important because you want to make sure you try to find someone who's the best fit yes. for the role. But in addition, you want to make sure that you're going about your selection process in a way that avoids all of the um, discrimination rules, the anti-discrimination rules that are out there on both a federal and a local level. Um, and by setting up your process in a way that says that this is the job, these are the key requirements, and then I go about trying to find somebody you're really reinforcing and supporting the fact that you had a non-discriminatory posting, you had a non-discriminatory process, and you ultimately pick somebody without regards to discrimination issues. All right, that makes sense. Do it right the first time. Right, and as far as those postings go and the application forms, if you have application forms, um, both at the DC level and then now at the Maryland level, there's a term called ban the box, yes. which relates to the issue of criminal arrests and or convictions. And we live in a jurisdiction here in DC, and then now, now Maryland's uh, moving in this direction where the application form itself, as well as the interview process, uh, uh, in general, shouldn't be looking at somebody's arrest or criminal history. And that's, that, that's, that, that's only looked at, if at all, after someone gets an offer. Yeah, um, and the Pro Bono Center, again, has resources on that on our resource site. And so if you have questions, feel free to log on and look at that or to come to one of our small business clinics and talk with an attorney about it. Right. And I'll briefly mention the other the other topics for the hiring process um, I, I raised earlier. That's interviewing. So make sure that, again, you're focusing on the job description and the job requirements and that you're documenting the information you receive, the information you've learned about the various candidates you're looking at. And one of the sort of um, modern issues or problems that, that we've seen um, is the, the, the prevalence of social media accounts and employers wanting to look at people's sort of private social media accounts. There might even in some cases be legal privacy restrictions on doing that. And there also could be, could be some concerns that the purpose of looking at social media accounts, even though it may be interesting and it may be informative, at the end of the day, doesn't really link up to the job requirements and the eligibility criteria that you're using for the job. Okay, so again, if somebody decides that they're going to hire an employee, before they go through this process, it might be good to talk one-on-one -on -one with an attorney about making sure that you know the interview goes smoothly and that they're asking and doing things that are legally above board. Right, um, and, then, and then that goes for offer letters too, which you can Google offer letter templates out there, but I caution, the automatic use of anything you, you find through Google. Um, Google's not barred uh, here in DC. So um, having a written offer letter though is, is really important. It doesn't have to be long, but it would basically define the job. It would define the start date. It would define what the compensation structure is. It would define hours in some cases, and it would make very clear whether or not that person is engaged as, what's, uh, as an at-will employee, which means the relationship can end at any time versus that person being engaged for some sort of fixed term uh, as an employee. Okay, and similar to some of the information you just talked about that we need in offer letters, in DC, once you've hired someone, there's a form you need to give them called the Notice of Hire form, which contains, as I said, much of the same information. Um, and this is mandatory in the district, information that must be provided to employees. Right, it's a special DC only requirement. Um, and in many, in many ways, it mirrors what I just outlined is a best practice for offer letters. Um, but again, it's a, it's a special form, it's available online, and it is required with respect to new employees. 
And another required form when you bring on a new employee is the federal I-9 form. Yes, one of the critical components of the federal um, of the federal employment law system is work eligibility. So that is a form and a process that requires employee employers to make sure that each individual that's hired as an employee is eligible to work in the United States. All right. So you've gone through the process as a small business owner, posting the job, interviewing someone, giving them the offer letter, the notice of hire form, and you got their I-9 done. Yes. And now you're thinking, oh my goodness, <laughs> what are all of the kind of legal things that now fall on me? Um, yes. Okay. So something that many small business owners uh, may have done before they hired an employee, but must do once they hire employees register with the IRS for an employer identification number. And that is effectively the social security number for your business. Um, everything will be tied to it. You need it to pay federal taxes. Uh, you may also need to register with your local government or state government right. for an ID number related to that. And as an employer, you also have lots of HR and in benefits responsibilities. Yes, uh, so HR is uh, generally what we, the term we use for human resources. Um, and for small businesses, uh, this, this could mean partnering with, with various companies or providers of, of payroll and benefits uh, systems, but it's critical from sort of day one, if you will, of having an employee that you have some sort of payroll system to document hours, to make sure that paychecks are issued on time, to make sure that Social Security is taken out, that Medicare taxes are taken out, that, that federal or state income taxes are taken out as appropriate. Um, and also to make sure that through that system, you're complying with minimum wage laws, which in DC is going up to $15 an hour. Uh, later this, this year, there's also overtime requirements for individuals who uh, work beyond 40 hours. Um, and then, this may be an issue that becomes uh, more of, 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 a, of a problem down the line, but making sure that any sort of benefit systems that are in place yes. um, are managed consistently and, and according to law. Um, that's all what we consider part of, part, of the, or part of the foundational HR systems and programs. Also, you're gonna need to think about whether workers' compensation is required in your jurisdiction, unemployment compensation, and think about what mandatory notices and posters have to be posted in employees' workplace. Yes, and, and this and all of those uh, issues really go back to a critical question of where is this employee based? So we live in an area that um, sometimes offices, sometimes employees cross boundaries between DC, mm -hmm. Maryland, and Virginia. Um, and generally the tests are gonna look at where is that employee primarily working so for example, you couldn't have the person primarily working in DC, but just have their physical address be Arlington. And maybe they come to Arlington like one hour every other week and just say they're a Virginia employee. That probably won't fly. All right. So it's important to think about where's that person primarily working. And if it is just the District of Columbia to make sure that you're signing up for the, the DC workers' compensation program in case that employee is injured uh, in the course of performing his or her duties, that you're signed up for the unemployment compensation system. So from a tax perspective and a, a job loss perspective, that individual is eligible for the benefits. And then to your point about the notices and posters, I, I think we're up to in the range of uh, uh, 12 to 15 mandatory posters. Um, it might, might sound a little antiquated this day to, you know, to actually think about a physical bulletin board where you have these paper notices posted, but that, that goes back to laws from, from, from many years or decades ago. Um, and there, there are both federal posters that are required as well as state and local posters. And so just making sure that you identify those, again, we have resources uh, here that can help with that and that those are physically posted or available to your employees. All right, but that's not where the legal obligations end. Being an employer has a lot of ongoing things that you have to make sure you keep up with. Um, you know, we talked about it a little bit in the job posting and interview process, but as an employer, you have to make sure that you're not discriminating against employees for, you know, anything that the federal government 
or the local jurisdiction where your employees are says you can't. Yes, and really, I like to think about the federal rules at this point as the floor is really just the base because for the most part, the the laws in DC and, and Maryland to some extent are much more expansive and protective of employees than the federal law. So from a discrimination um, angle, the federal law is protecting general characteristics like race, color, religion, gender, national origin, um, just to name a few. Uh, but then the DC law is going to add to it a bunch of other categories that are across the country somewhat unique. So items like marital status, personal appearance, um, even political affiliation, uh, family responsibilities, fam familial status, place of resident and credit information. These are all categories that in, in general DC has said are relevant to the person's job, to the hiring of that person and to that person's ongoing employment. So it's really important again that we think about the job requirements yeah. and the job performance and try to extract and disconnect uh, the, 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 the employment from, from all these issues. Yep. And, you know, something that can sometimes go hand in hand with anti-discrimination or, you know, accommodating employees is disability accommodation and leave, um, where that's applicable. So, you know, off the top of my head, the Americans with Disabilities Act, I'm thinking of the pay, um, the Family and Medical Leave Act, um, and then DC also has the Family and Medical Leave Act for employers um, that are smaller than the federal government threshold. And yes. there's lots of other DC specific things. You know, there's stuff that the federal government hasn't addressed. Uh, many of our neighboring jurisdictions haven't. But if you're an employer with employees in DC, you have to think about giving them leave and rights, um, and it places a lot of obligations on you. Yes, and, and so I think that this can all broadly be put into the category of time off from work and, and disability accommodations. Mm -hmm. And um, this can be a challenge, especially for small businesses. And in many cases, small businesses have reduced obligations, or in some cases, no obligations under certain laws uh, in this category. But as you, as you take on one or more employees, um, thinking about managing the schedule, managing mm -hmm. the work that they perform, but also realizing that there may be obligations to give them time off from work to deal with medical or, or family issues, um, as well as the need to think about accommodating that person with regard to scheduling and the performance mm -hmm. of work um, to, to deal with disabilities or other medical issues. And so, for example, in DC, there's a special law called the Sick and Safe Leave Law, which requires businesses, including small businesses that have less than 25 employees, so between one and 25, uh, that employees as they work, um, they accrue paid time off. Um, and the formula for the small businesses under 25 is one hour of paid time off for every 87 hours worked, capped at three paid days per mm -hmm. calendar year. And another DC law, that applies to small businesses, even if they only have one employee, um, is paid family leave, which is going into effect July 1st, 2020. Right, and that is a new uh, um, movement, if you will, across the across the United States and some in some states and, and and cities to require employers to contribute to a government fund. Uh, and in this case, it's a 0.62% contribution from the employer to this government fund where then individuals can apply for, in some cases, several weeks or more paid leave associated with certain medical or other conditions. And so both sick and safe leave and paid family leave are paid leave that small businesses must give to employees. Um, through Sick and Safe Leave Act, the burden of payment is on the small business owner. Um, and through paid family leave, as David mentioned, it's through the district government, but the employer makes a contribution. Correct. Okay. Correct. And, and then just I'll also mention under this leave category that DC has a law about parental leave for school events. So participating in school conferences and other school uh, programming related to children can be eligible for up to 24 hours leave in a, in a given year. Um, 
there's also commuter benefit programs in DC that may be applicable to employees. So bottom line is that um, once a business has hired an employee or is looking to hire an employee, these are things that, again, they can be complicated and they can be, um, uh, to some people, a little, a little scary. But if you just really kind of go step by step, break it down and, and do what you have to do with resources and support, um, ultimately, you're going to be complying with the law, number one, yeah. and you're going to be making your life easier in the long run. Yeah. Um, you know, we've talked about all of these different obligations, legal and otherwise. And these things, you know, they don't come cheap to implement. But if you don't comply, there's some pretty serious penalties for noncompliance with anti-discrimination laws, employment, wage and hour laws. Um, you know, if the district government comes after you, hiring an attorney to represent you, that's not inexpensive. Or, you know, fines, treble damages to employees they may be levied against you, reputational damages, loss of business. Um, so, you know, going wrong has some costs, but also doing things right can cost, um, you know, having an employee or more than one Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's a best practice to have an employee handbook, but that's going to cost some money to make sure you get it right, probably, if you want an attorney to review it. Yeah, and I think your your comments, Christine, go to the notion of spending the extra time and, and or understanding the additional costs that might come with the employment model mm -hmm. earlier may look like a burden or a challenge, but in the long run, you're gonna be better off because you've minimized the chances of litigation. Mm -hmm. You've minimized the chances of government investigation you and you minimize the chances of penalties or damages for not having done things right. Yeah. And I think when you look at beyond the legal requirements, are there best practices that businesses, whether they're small or medium or large, engage in in order to not only meet legal requirements with employees, but reinforce um, a place of work that is supportive and a place that's less likely to have disputes mm -hmm. and a place that's less likely to cause litigation or, or conflict. And the two key things I wanted to highlight um, today are having some sort of handbook or policy guide mm -hmm. that just spells out some of the key aspects of the relationship and the expectations yeah. um, and have that available to individuals as soon as they're hired and as long as they're engaged. And then in addition, have some sort of performance management system so that person understands are they performing well or not and how can they be supported better to reach a, a satisfactory or better level of, of performance and through that process if they don't they won't necessarily be surprised when the relationship ends versus a, a business that doesn't have that type of system in place where it's not sort of rewarding the best yeah. people and it's not communicating with the people that have opportunities or challenges, if you will, for, for, for growth. Um, and, 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 and at the end, uh, letting go of people without having that engagement yeah. is often the source of charges and litigation and investigations into that business. Yeah, um, you know, doing it right, again, it's so important. And, you know, some of these best practices, but not legal requirements for folks in the DC area are things that the Pro Bono Center can help with. If you have questions, come to our monthly small business brief advice legal clinic and chat with an attorney about what's going on. Um, and we can provide you with some brief legal advice. You know, there's a lot to think about that we've chatted about today. You know, whether or not to have an employee or an independent contractor, or maybe it's a decision that's already been made based on the needs of the business. Um, and all the things that come along with it. And, you know, I hope that small business owners can take this information and move forward with their business, whether it's growth or, um, you know, figuring things out, having more questions, chatting with an attorney about what's right for them. Um, and thanks, J David, for joining us today and sharing your insights. For more information or to access the DC Bar Pro Bono Center's podcasts, webinars, and other helpful information, you can visit our resource center at www.lawhelp.org slash DC slash CED. Thank you again for joining us today, David. Any closing words? Well, I appreciate the opportunity to, to talk with you and 
uh, ultimately to uh, the listeners out there. Um, it's an exciting time with the economy and with the opportunities out there and small businesses are on, are on the front lines of, of giving people opportunity and uh, really being a part of the larger economic framework. And so again, we've talked about some, some obligations and some restrictions, but ultimately, I think having our, our perspective on what is, what is my business trying to achieve and using the legal system when it comes to employment or contractors to, to support your business goals is probably the best way to look at it versus look at these as restrictions or barriers to accomplishing your goals. All right. Well, thanks again, David. And thanks to all of you for listening. Thank you.